All right, well then I guess you guys get lots of individual attention. Uh, kind of like my patent class at Southwestern, except they're all on Facebook. Uh, I'm sure you guys aren't on Facebook. So, today I'm going to tell you a story about the uh, artificial intelligence and the changing nature of drug discovery. I was planning to just plow through that, but now that we're no longer so rushed, you'll get the whole exciting story. Then I'm going to talk about how computers can and have started innovating in ways traditionally protected by patents, a phenomenon I refer to as computational invention. I'm hardly the first person to recognize this, but I did come up with this highly creative term, and I am trying to get a nickel every time someone repeats it uh, in speech or commits it to writing. Finally, I'm going to talk about whether it is possible and desirable to protect patents created by computers and whether it is possible and desirable to have a computer being a legal inventor. And then I'm going to discuss some of the implications of computational invention and some of its challenges. For those of you who read the paper that's up, and I'm sure all of you read the paper, there's a substantially changed version forthcoming to SSRN soon. This look familiar to anyone? Wheel of Fortune fans here, right you are, right? So this is Watson competing in 2011 in the Jeopardy game. He competed against former winners Brad uh, Rudder and Ken, well, I, I, he won a million dollars for IBM. Uh, and Watson is a step forward in having computers model human intelligence. And what it does is it generates millions of solutions to possible questions looking at quintillions of possibilities and then uh, using its algorithms to figure out which solutions are more, most likely to be accurate. Watson's Jeopardy career was short and sweet and it soon moved on to even tastier endeavors, namely cooking. So Watson, similar to what it did on Jeopardy, is now designing new food recipes, again by harnessing the power of its software massive computing power and databases far uh, in excess of anything a human being could work with. Apparently Watson has decided that bear meat and sandalwood pair together deliciously. But Watson isn't just figuring out delicious new things for me to eat. Watson is coming up with new food recipes that are novel, non-obvious, and useful. And Watson is coming up with ideas that if invented by a human being would be patentable. My paper talks about this phenomenon in the context of drug development, just because that's one of the areas I work in, and where it's very easy to imagine a computer like Watson innovating. It's particularly easy to imagine a computer like Watson innovating in this space because Google is having large-scale machines do this sort of work, and in fact, IBM is applying Watson in assisting physicians and utilization managers make clinical decision-making. And I give in the paper uh, a number of hypotheticals for how a computer like Watson, though I named mine Hal in a uh, peak of creativity, could basically uh, function as inventors. So Watson could use very large databases and really without much direction at all find correlations between existing drug uses and improved clinical outcomes. So that's how we found things like uh, Viagra, which was treated, used for heart failure, that it uh, helped with erectile dysfunction, or we, how we found that Botox, which was used to treat muscle spasms, helped with the appearance of fine wrinkles. That was in the clinic, but you could do that with large databases. Watson could do all of the modeling for a new drug completely in silico, uh, which is to say virtually. It could identify drug targets. It could model potential drug treatments by combining random sequences of proteins to find, say, antibodies that would treat a drug target. That's one of the examples in my paper. It could design clinical trials. In fact, I learned researching this that how it could even rewrite its own programming, uh, a phenomenon referred to as reflection, and why Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking think that the computer apocalypse is close at hand. Ultimately, what is interesting about the hypotheticals I provide, I think, is that while people set HAL in motion, HAL could do most of that innovation with little or no human involvement. And if HAL was human, HAL would be an inventor. So that begs a couple of questions. That's your title. 
That's my title? If Hal was human, he'd be an inventor. <laughs> well, I also thought about, I think, therefore I am an inventor. And I have one more for you. But I, I, maybe I do need to work on the title a little. I like Brad's. I love Brad's. That was his. He's, anyway, sorry. No, 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 it's okay. Go. That's what we're here for. Right? So question number one is, are computational inventions, which is to say inventions created by a computer patent, and that's of practical as well as theoretical importance, right? The computer is doing the inventor's work, and inventors have the ownership rights, presumptively. Not to mention that failure to list an inventor can make a patent invalid or unenforceable. Uh, if computers can legally be inventors, that's not much of an issue. But textually, at least, on the surface, a computer really couldn't be an inventor. And the reason for that dates at least back to the 1952 Patent Act, which says that inventors have to be individuals that an invention is a mental act. And the reason that the 1952 Act framed it that way was they wanted to prevent corporations from becoming inventors, as they can in much of the rest of the world, for example, in Europe. So it may be that preventing a corporate inventor has acted to prevent a computer inventor. Well, what happens then if you can't have a computer inventor? Well, one option is that you can't have a patent, right? There's no inventor, you can't have a patent. Anyone remember this photo? It is kind of adorable, but apparently it's smiling at you means it's feeling hostile. So if you ever actually see a black and calm monkey doing that, you might want to run. Um, <clears throat> no, I don't know how big they are. Anyway, right, so in 2011, a monkey took a selfie, and the photographer, after the picture started becoming famous on the internet, said, oh, that's mine, I have copyright ownership of it. And the U.S. Copyright Office said, no, no human took that photo, no human can own it. So it is in the public domain. So you can apply that reasoning in the patent context and say, if a computer invents something, you know, there's no human inventor, no one can own the thing. And a court might, you know, decide that's a good reason because Pam Samuelson in 1985 and 6 said, computers don't need incentives to be inventors, and that's really why we have according to the Constitution, patent laws, period. You could say it chills future human innovation. You could say that um, it's really unfair to reward a human for being an inventor when really how did all of the work of doing this. More likely, though, I think it is the case that uh, computational inventions would still be patentable. And the reason for that is that you can have discoveries and accidental invention. So if I spill some Botox on the floor and it does a really good job of getting a spot out of the carpet, right? I can patent Botox for carpet cleaning even though I didn't think about doing that in advance. Even though I recognized and essentially conceived of the invention after it was reduced to practice, right? And a lot of things are invented that way. So in that case, computational inventions would only be patentable when subsequently discovered by a human or more accurately, computational inventions would be unpatentable, but when the underlying subject matter is subsequently discovered by a human, that becomes patentable. Which begs another possible title question. If a computer invents and there's no one around to recognize it, has there been an invention? <laughs> I can do that all day. <laughs> so we've got that. Next is, well, should a computer be an inventor? And I argue that having a system where a computer invents but a person discovers it and becomes an inventor isn't a very good system. And the reason for that is at least threefold. One, logistical. So we've got my computer, Hal, working at Abbott Laboratories, no relationship to my last name, and it's looking at large databases of patient care to find new use patents, and it just says, this statin is useful for male pattern hair loss. Right? And an intern walks by and sees that and says, oh, that's interesting, right? That intern's now the inventor. Or maybe I'm just walking through the building. Or maybe Hal emails the entire R&D department and a thousand people are concurrently inventing this thing by recognizing it at the same time. So it would produce logistical problems. But more importantly, I think it would be unfair and inefficient to reward a human being for recognizing inventive work like this when the computer was doing really all of the inventive character of the work. Right? Unfair because the person hadn't really done anything to deserve it, and inefficient because it might not promote innovation in the way we want it to if really the person who's getting rewarded for invention is just happening across a computer's work and almost appropriating. 
So if maybe we do want computers to be inventors, uh, you know, I think it still might be possible. And I look at, you know, why we have patents in the first place, and that's Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, which provides a utilitarian rationale for granting patents. Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science by essentially granting patents. So Pam Samuels, ah, Professor Samuelson says, you know, computers don't need patents because computers don't need incentives. And while that may be true, humans need incentives, and people need incentives to build creative computers. And so I argue that by giving patents computers, what you're doing is incentivizing human developers to make more machines that are capable of coming up with more inventions. And that, in turn, will lead to more scientific advances, and that's kind of really what we want to do. Right? And there's other utilitarian benefits. So, you know, if we're in the drug context, if my hypothetical company, Abbott, doesn't have patent protection for its new drug that Howe created, maybe they're not going to invest the questionable $2 billion, $2.5 billion to turning it into an approved drug. Abbott might say, well, you know, this new use is interesting, but we can't protect it with a patent, so we're just going to keep it as a trade secret. So it would promote uh, commercialization and disclosure. Of course, not necessarily the case that it would be utilitarianly positive, right? So in the software context, maybe patents aren't so great. There, there's, you know, quick innovation, quickly superseded. Patent thickets are a problem. There's a significant first mover advantage. So likewise, there might be other incentives for developing creative computers, and if you don't really need patents, then maybe it isn't the best type of system, right? And it's not just utilitarian. Uh, people have had a lot of different reasons for proposing in courts that patents are appropriate. So a Lockean theory says, you know, if you are laboring on um, resources held in common, you deserve the rights of your labor. Probably not so important for how, which really kind of isn't a person and it wouldn't be wrong to appropriate its labor. Personality theory holds that, well, we patent in part to fulfill a human need and how is doing that. A social planning theory thinks that, well, we want to promote a, a good culture through granting patents, but, uh, you know, how probably would be, if anything, a concerning recipient because how doesn't have a moral compass, although a human would be able to uh, pass judgment on it before it was submitted for patent. I propose kind of thinking about this through the lens of Section 101, which has to do with patentable subject matter. So Section 101 says basically any product process where all that stuff is patentable, and that's pretty much everything. But courts have carved out some exceptions to it. They've said, well, you know, we're not really going to allow laws of nature or abstract ideas or um, <clears throat> uh, algorithms. And they did that largely to carve out those common law exceptions due to concerns about preemption. So they were concerned that, if, well, if you can go patent a product of nature, it's going to keep other people from innovating. E has always equaled MC squared. It's not really fair for Einstein to tie that up, but so many more inventions might come down the pike after it. And again, also in part of belief that, that sort of fundamental knowledge that's discovered rather than invented and that no one should be able to tie it up. Um, in a sense, this adds computational invention to that list of exceptions, right? But it's unclear that that should be the case. Uh, this doesn't have any of the pre preemption concerns that the other patentable subject, uh, ineligible subject matter patents do. And also, unlike, say, products of nature, which were created by nature and discovered by a person, how only came about as a result of human ingenuity. And in section one, we've had some exciting cases, you know, Chakrabarty long ago, Myriad's a much more recent one where courts have said, you know, really this is a dynamic provision and true, we've had these exceptions for 150 years, but really we need to be constantly innovating uh, our intellectual property theories and thinking about why we have those theories and what's going to promote innovation. And so I argue that because on the whole, allowing these patents and computers to be inventors is going to promote innovation, it's something that we ought to promote. So if we do allow computational inventions, and if we do allow computers to be inventors, it raises the issue of, well, who owns the patent then? So maybe a computer could own a patent, but I tend to think that um, computer personhood's probably not in the near horizon. So who then? 
Well, owners certainly seem to be an appealing candidate. Uh, that would be consistent with the way we generally treat personal property, right? Computers and patents being personal property. But there's other options. So you could have users, right? So you might example imagine that Watts, IBM, which owns Watson, is leasing it out or renting it or licensing it or just making it publicly available, which it is to numerous partners and developers. Uh, I assume they have an IP license for it, but I don't really know. Right? But you could imagine that if you had access to Watson's artificial intelligence, which would be easy for IBM to copy and provide to you, that you could use Watson or Watson kind of wall in your possession to come up with these sorts of inventions. Uh, and then maybe the user of Watson would have ownership rights, but I think that's probably less good than the owner having rights, in part because IBM might then be incentivized to restrict access to its artificial intelligence, and I don't think that's a good solution, and I also think it would mean less innovation would occur. So as between an owner and a user, I propose that the owner should have the right to it. <laughs> Anyone see the movie Her? Yes. Right, so, well, of course, Brett's in the movie Her, right? So in Her, Jaquin Phoenix goes out and buys a artificially intelligent operating system voiced by Scarlett Johansson. And Scarlett Johansson is a uh, very sophisticated computer that at one point takes all of the things that Joaquin Phoenix had already written, packages them into a book, submits it to get published, and the book does get published. Right? And organizing copyrightable material may have some you know, expressive copyright protection for it. So maybe Scarlett Johansson's operating system would be an author for that. Right? If you think about that in the patent context, that's kind of one of the real problems with having an owner get rights to this sort of thing, right? Jaquin Phoenix has just sort of sat there while this computer he purchased went and made some IP for him, which he would now own. Uh, but even so, I think that as between, say, ownership being with whoever developed the operating system or whoever currently owns the operating system, again, having the owner uh, get patent rights is probably a better solution. If uh, IBM is concerned that it sells Watson, it is going to lose its rights, it could either sell Watson for the value of the inventions Watson is likely to make, or sell it, or license it instead. So you might imagine Jaquin Phoenix, when he bought that operating system, had some shrink uh, wrap uh, contract language on it, which says anything that Samantha, your operating system invents, actually Windows owns. Uh, well, I made that presentation the last 22 minutes with questions. That seems kind of right. Oh, wait, no, 15 minutes with questions. So, <laughs> questions? Brett. Um, so, the funny thing is, you dismissed what I thought was potentially a very interesting question, which is the. Uh, so there's two, ways, two titles you could have, and maybe you have both. Maybe the second one just appears in the middle of the paper somewhere. Uh, one is, it, I think your, the original thing you said was, uh, if Hal was a human, it, she would be an inventor. I think you said either. Fair enough. Right? Now, you also could say, if Hal is an inventor, then is Hal human? Does Hal pass the Turing test? In other words, is creativity or inventiveness an indicia of uh, being, of thinking, human intelligence? I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but so the mm -hmm. Turing test was about when computers, artificial intelligence, sort of, are indistinguishable from humans and thus uh, potentially different and special in the sense that they do something that humans can do and that other machines can't. Right? There's, so I'm writing about this, I'm just not totally uh, into this. So, you know, there's a huge, and there is a big, ongoing debate about, you mentioned Musk and all those guys in the artificial intelligence world, but there's other people who are spending a lot of time, philosophers and whatever, about when, you know, if computers, Hal being a good example, become, not only they pass the Turing, but if when they ha bear a certain indicia of humanity, right, and they're indistinguishable on a bunch of different things, like, would, you know, would it be discriminatory not to recognize their humanity. And so one way, I don't know, I was, I was intrigued by all this because in fact, to the extent that Hal, or you know, that, uh, or you're using Hal, or it's Watson, or other, other big data, big data driven automated artificial intelligence is develop a capability to, with their own autonomy, and not at the direction of their human overlords, 
right, or, or users invent, which is, I think that's the assumption you make, right? Because if, if, if a human is actually directing in any right. meaningful way, then that's the invent, then it's easy. There's the invent. Well, I don't know if I'd say in any meaningful way. I mean, if, if it was providing a little direction, how was it providing a lot of feedback? You might have co-inventorship, right? Or if it was a very minimal amount of direction, how might be the inventor? But I, A, have found some historical things that I haven't woven in yet, B, provide scenarios. I, I think it is really completely possible to how without any human direction per se, right, besides sort of setting it in motion, Spitting out would go on to find these things. I mean, the developers make how, right, but in my hypothetical where Hal is researching a vaccine, they just design it as a tool, and then Hal independently sort of goes and does that. I mean, it's clear to me that if I took out Hal being a computer, no one would bat an eye at what Hal did, right, that Hal does have that functionality, and that that would meet the inventorship criteria. Uh, so know. maybe it's just a totally different paper and it's a spin-off, but it'd be very interesting to explore whether inventorship, as you did, if that's true, then that suggests something about how's, uh, about the personhood question that no. people are really struggling with. I sure it does. There was another great science fiction movie, because you like science fiction movies, about a guy working for a company like Google that's taken to a remote woods. It was kind of an indie film. Yeah, I know. I don't forget the name of it. Yeah, I know. Right, and he went to go test this artificial intelligence to see if it passed the Turing test, right? Maybe one of the tests he should have administered was, can you invent something? Can you invent something? Uh, which is a whole separate interesting issue. It is true that is kind of not what I focused on, but I agree it's a very interesting question, and maybe that's a spin out for me. Yeah. In which case, I think, therefore, I'm an inventor. Well, I guess, I don't know. Yeah. But I, yeah. Um, so I was thinking about the recipes, and I couldn't get past non-obviousness. Um, so it was very interesting to think about this how as actually the hypothetical construct we have as the Fasida who has all the prior art, speaks all the languages, all sort of taped around her. Um, and I would think that, you know, maybe it's my limits of understanding AI, but I would think if, he, if Hal takes all of this input and says, ah, sandalwood pairs with bear meat, if that really, I would think, has to come from the known prior art and would be obvious. But so, like I said, I may just not understand AI. Well, according to IBM, that's not how it works. So. One, right, it is hard to patent a food recipe, though I did look at a US PTO guidance that says, well, you, or not a guidance, but a, a letter saying, well, sometimes food is patentable. Not obvious this is a high barrier in a food recipe. And that's actually kind of where Hal excels. So Hal doesn't just sort of look at things that have already been paired together and find, you know what, in the 16th century, someone put bear meat with sandalwood and wasn't that supposed to be delicious, let's try it again. Uh, apparently, you know, because it doesn't quite have a human palate, it breaks down food tastes according to, in part, their molecular structure. Right. And figures out how, according to, you know, ways that different molecular combinations of food have paired well together that maybe these would. So, I mean, you know, to the extent that invention is a mental act, right, it isn't entirely clear how, how much what Hal doing is analogous to what a human is doing. But what I am sure of is that if a human had come up with that same invention, it would have been packed and how did all of the work, right? Although, I mean, that is an interesting question, you know. Right. What is happening in the mind of the computer versus the inventor? It has perfect understanding of the chemicals. So I think of it as, for that computer and understand those chemicals, it's kind of like us saying, well, if I add sugar to it, it would taste good. You know, well, that's obvious to us because we know sugar is sweet and it's sweet everything else. And Hal just has that knowledge but for every single chemical. So to me, it would be obvious, but again. So I mean, it's an interesting idea, that folk, like thinking of Hal as the Fosita as opposed to Hal as the inventor. And that's an, it's, right. have, you, have you thought about that? Is that in the paper somewhere? Like thinking about Fosita, like making the connection between Watson, Fosita, Watson, you have, Watson and yeah. the Fosita concept? I mean, that's kind of neat, too. <laughs> I haven't really, and that's definitely kind of an interesting angle on it. Um, I mean, not all patents, right, in my opinion, are really that non-obvious, right? So you look at, you know, new use patents, right? So, okay, I'm a doctor, and patients are taking Viagra and coming in and saying, boy, doc, I've got this great erection. Can I keep getting Viagra, right? Like, so someone got a new use patent for that. I mean, but, you know, how non-obvious is it really for the physician to say, boy, maybe, you know, maybe it's the drug, right? Or you look at a database where how it could definitely work autonomously because the statistical 
techniques required to correlate a new use to drug use really aren't that sophisticated. It just requires a lot of computing power and a really big database, right? So, I mean, it's just got a bunch of algorithms that's running like, you know, maybe in three seconds how it tells you that, you know, this statin is good for male pattern hair loss. Uh, you know, maybe an interesting paper is also, you know, kind of what does it mean to really be inventive and what's kind of the human thought that has to go into that, right? But that doesn't seem to me to be the way that courts look at whether an invention is not obvious. Uh, maybe that's kind of one of the problems people have with products of nature where really the discovery of it can be a really inventive process, right? Like binding tax off, well, that was practical, right? But, you know, finding a bacteria, you know, does such and such a thing, but uh, well, I'm kind of rambling. But I think maybe my better spin-off thought of that was, you know, courts don't really look at kind of what's happening in there, but maybe they should. And maybe that would take patent law down a whole new direction in terms of what should be inventive, although. Well, I, I'm not feeling like the patent, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, that would be a lot of questions to jump in, but like, there is, so like if you think about what some of the, uh, advocacy pieces or reform proposals people have made over the last decade, some of them are about, like, we should make non-obviousness work better, we should raise the bar in patent law because we have a lot of crappy patents that shouldn't be awarded. So one thought experiment would be, would how be the way to raise the bar? At least in certain subject areas. Like, in certain subject areas that are amenable to computational invention, is hmm. how a good way to check whether something's obvious. Somebody is working on a paper, I just can't remember who. Um, using AI and obviousness as a check at the patent office, as a first pass at the yeah. patent office. And as soon as I think of that person, I will, I will email you their name. Yeah, that'd be great. I know Bobby had her hands up. No, I was just sort of intrigued with your with your running discourse, you know, with Brett. And what it reminded me about was in the copyright realm, there actually was a case that considered non-human authorship of a quote-unquote copyrighted work, and that was the Chapman Kelly Chicago Park District versus Chapman Kelly case which was decided you know, right here in the Seventh Circuit. So that case, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it involved um, uh, this big um, uh, landscape garden that was the size of two football fields, and the city came in and you know, destroyed it, and of course the artist wasn't too pleased to be sued based on, basically based on moral rights. But in the context of deciding moral rights, the court had to address whether or not this work was copyrightable. And basically what the Seventh Circuit said was, well, you know, this is a landscape garden, and it's got basically input from nature, and therefore it can't be fixed, and it's you know too ephemeral, and therefore no, it's not you know copyrightable. I've actually written about that case and criticized the court's um, discussion of that because it does seem to me that you know as long as there is some human authorship, which there clearly was here, you know if the author embraces all of it, even the nature aspect of it, it, it should be copyrightable. It's not what the Seventh Circuit said. But I think there might be, um, I'm not an expert on patent law, clearly, but there, it might, there might be some sort of analogy to some of these non-human uh, elements that you're talking about in the context of patents and, and personhood, you know, which is something that has an analogy in copyright law. Oh, that's very I had another thought also kind of on the way maybe that Hal and uh, a human being are thinking about these things actually now that I think about it. So what how so what humans do sometimes is they write, and this isn't really my area, but they make these inferential jumps and you know, deductions and you know, kind of semi -linear, linear thought. Hal doesn't do any of that. Hal has a question and then it generates a million possibilities, right? And then it uses an algorithm to predict which is most useful. Right? Uh, and I guess it's hard to imagine that, you know, right, so 20, 30, 50 years from now, as computers get more and more sophisticated that, it's hard to imagine kind of an invention that a computer couldn't make. I mean, maybe kind of this paper's talking about, well, isn't it kind of like groundbreaking to think that a computer is making an invention, right? But as databases get better, predictive algorithms get better, computing power gets better, like what couldn't the operating system in her invent? And then, well, yeah. The, an the answer is that these things, so the people who study like big data and data analytics and all that kind of stuff, uh, I think, emphasize, and like Felix Wu is somebody you should talk to my colleague from Cardozo who knows all this stuff better than I do. Uh, but one of the answers is it's always based on the existing state of knowledge. So after a while, all that the AI inventors are going to be able to invent is the stuff that, you know, it's always going to be based on what's already been invented. One of the things that humans do is they anticipate human needs and wants and sort of, you know, we have imagination in ways that computers don't. Right, and so 
Oh, well, maybe I'm wrong, I'm guessing, but so it's, it, well, what I'm thinking is what you described, right? The sort of, um, I, I, well, someone asks a question, I'm gonna sort of make, draw a bunch of possibilities and go to it. You know, part of the most creative aspect is the question that got asked. Right, uh, okay, so I like that. But here, think about this example. So this was something I was thinking of writing in a follow-up piece, right? Genetic code, right? You design with genetic code these proteins or organisms that do things, mm -hmm. right? Instead of thinking, you know, we need a modified bacteria to eat oil up, right? How could just model every possible combination of genetic code and then simulate what those things would do and invent every possible, right, genetically engineered antibody or microbacteria or something, right? And that would be creating new knowledge through just random permutations of existing knowledge, right? But wouldn't its, wouldn't its ability to simulate depend on what we currently know, currently know? Yeah about certain interactions? Like, well, wouldn't there be a limit to what they could, what could be simulated? Right, so I'm the, just guessing. I'm no, no, I, it's, a great, it's a great point. I guess I gotta wrap it up after I spout one more. What if DNA hadn't been discovered yet? Could how, you know, he's limited based on his prior. Well, well all right, so like, I, maybe how couldn't think of like a new type of DNA, but right, there's a limited number of natural permutations of DNA which are almost infinite, but for something like how maybe not infinite. And they could really invent every imaginable antibody. Andrew Luke. Chin did something like this at UNC. He published a huge database of just artificial ATC gene combinations. Um, and the patent office actually relied on it to invalidate a few patents. Yeah. Uh, and somebody's doing it in a 3D printing context for materials, just taking all known materials and just generating a huge text file of all possible combinations and permutations of, because these people are patenting uh, various feedstock for these 3D printers and they're saying, oh, this is patentable, it's so uh, it's not obvious, but uh, anyway, something to look at, Andrew Chin at, at UNC. All right, I guess I gotta get to the next speaker, but thanks for your comments and, you know, please.